Good afternoon, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here at the National Press Club this afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Nate Kaczmarek, and I have the privilege of directing the Federal Society's Article I Initiative and the Regulatory Transparency Project. It, even before I took responsibility over both of the projects, there was great interest uh, from each group in Professor Cochin's excellent paper titled, Strategic Institutional Positioning, How We Have Come to Generate Environmental Law Without Congress. Uh, we are therefore pleased to co-sponsor this event today under both banners and to, get, and to gather such a distinguished panel uh, to discuss it. The paper uh, was published in the Texas A&M Law Review and copies have been provided to each of you at your tables. I would note that complete bios for all of our speakers have been furnished to you on our website and the notices for today's program. So I will give an abbreviated introduction of our moderator and then get out of the way. Um, our moderator is Jeff Homestead. He is a partner at Bracewell and is a chairman of RTP's Energy and Environment Working Group. He is the former uh, assistant administrator of the EPA's Office of Air and Radiation, where he was the architect of several of the agency's most important initiatives. And I believe uh, he was also the longest serving head of that office. Is that right? Uh, he previously served at the White House as uh, associate counsel to former President uh, George H.W. Bush. He was also a law clerk to Judge uh, Douglas Ginsburg on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District uh, of Columbia. His JD was from Yale Law School and his BA from BYU. Uh, as I hand things off, a reminder to our audience uh, that we have set aside ample time for your questions at the end of the program, so please be thinking about the difficult questions you would like to ask them. Uh, with that, Jeff, the panel is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to do justice to the panelists here. I'll just give very brief introductions, and I, I do hope you'll, uh, you'll take a look on the website to see a little bit more about what, what, they're, what they've been doing. I will just say this. For those of you who think being a law professor is a cushy life, you really should look at Donald and Robert's uh, uh, bios on the website to see just how many things that they are involved in. Uh, Donald is the Parker S. Kennedy Professor of Law as well as the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development at Chapman University School of Law. Um, in addition to this publication, he has many other publications and a forthcoming book, Framing the Constitution, the Impact of Labels on Constitutional Interpretation, uh, to be published by Cambridge University Press next year. Um, he, uh, as well as Robert, I think are both elected members of the American Law Institute, uh, published many articles. I won't spend much more time on that because I want to make sure he has plenty of time to, uh, to discuss his paper, but he got his J degree from, from Cornell. Robert Percival is the Robert F. Stanton Professor of Law and the Director of the Environmental Law Program at the University of Maryland School of Law. Uh, he got his JD from Stanford Law School as well as an uh, MA in Economics, and uh, I understand that he graduated first in his class from Stanford. Uh, I think we have a couple of Supreme Court clerks, maybe, maybe even three on our panel. He clerked for Supreme Court Justice Byron White. Um, he too has published many, many law articles and someone who I've interacted with uh, and many times over the years and has been a leading voice uh, on environmental issues. Andrew Grossman uh, is, I think some of you know him as a frequent legal commentator. Uh, you've probably heard him on the radio or seen him on TV. Uh, he's been around Washington for many years, notwithstanding his youthful appearance. He is uh, a partner at, at the Washington, or in the DC office of Baker and Hotstetler, as well as an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. And finally, uh, Brianne Gorod uh, is the chief counsel for the Constitutional Accountability Center. She has also had a rather distinguished career for such a young person, um, uh, beginning as a clerk, including for, for, for at the district court, circuit court, and ultimately for, just, for Justice Stephen Breyer. Spent some time in private practice, was in at OLC, uh, and has been the chief counsel of the Constitutional Accountability Center for, uh, for several years now. She got her JD from Yale Law School and an MA and BS from Emory University. So, with that, all, with those all too brief introductions, let me turn the time over first to Donald. We're, I think each of our panelists is going to speak for around 10 minutes, and then we'll have a, a bit of a discussion up here, and then leave plenty of time for questions from the audience. 
Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to my fellow panelists for uh, being here uh, together today. Uh, thanks to the Federal Society, to the Regulatory Transparency Project, and the Article One Initiative for organizing this event. Um, we're talking today about agency rulemaking, unnecessary delegation, or indispensable assistance. Um, the concerns about delegation over agencies having too much authority, or perhaps some people think not enough, um, but if it is too much, uh, at least that is uh, discussed along the metrics of whether or not we dislike the breadth whether or not we dislike delegation because it makes agencies are less democratically accountable. Another concern is that they are exercising legislative functions outside of our separation of powers. Um, those are all issues which I hope we'll get to today. What I want to focus on a bit is on the behavioral aspects of why we might be in this place that we are today, why we've gotten to the point where delegation is, is uh, uh, so broad, and uh, why there's there's in many ways, reasons why we should not expect it to change, that it is mutually beneficial for both Congress and the executive to engage in the type of delegation power that we're seeing today. Um, so my opening remarks will set the stage for why I think that's happening, and then we can get into some of the examples as to what we, uh, where we see it happening in particular instances, and also thereafter uh, what we might be able to do about it. So this talk is about strategic interests. Both Congress and the agencies have strategic interests at stake that cause them to position their activities in a manner that makes them each complicit in the expansion of the regulatory state and the collapse of the containment walls designed by, in the Constitution to, in, to keep this separation of powers intact. The focus of these remarks will be uh, in part on this, as I said, on these behavioral aspects. Over the past several decades, both political science, law and economics, and other disciplines have revealed that we shouldn't trust our political actors to necessarily be public spirited or public minded or public interested, but that instead uh, we should look at them as humans, human actors with human incentives and human interests, including the self interest to uh, protect and expand their power. And some of those uh, things uh, about protecting and expanding the power are why we see the delegation resulting where we do today. So I'm going to focus on. Uh, three major points. The first is going to be, what did the framers expect, or at least what did, the, what did some of the founding documents uh, tell us we should have expected about the separation of powers and how it should have worked to actually uh, create these containment walls against the delegation that we're seeing today? Then what are we actually seeing happening instead? And then lastly, why are we seeing that happening? And then I think in the Q&A as well as the rest of the panel discussion, we can get into some of the examples of where it's happening and perhaps what we can do about it. Uh, the framers' expectations is where I'll start. The framers relied on an institutional self-interest uh, model as a feature of the constitutional system, not a bug. It was a feature that, that each, each uh, branch of government would, in fact, be self-interested. Consider Federalist number nine. Alexam Alexander Hamilton noted, quote, the regular distribution of power into distinct departments are means and powerful means by which the excellencies of Republican government may be retained and its imperfections lessened or avoided. In his famous If Men Were Angels passage in Federalist 51, James Madison powerfully warned that, quote, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige to control itself. Well, one of the ways in which we oblige the, govern the governors to control themselves is to control each other. They should be acting in their institutional self-interest to protect against aggrandizement by other branches. James Madison continued to observe, particularly in Federalist number 48 and 51, that there must be auxiliary precautions that uh, exist within our system to protect uh, this. We must go beyond mere parchment barriers. And he recognized the idea of human nature and the control that we need to control against nature's tendency toward aggrandizement of power. So the framers sought to craft this constitution that would use human nature against itself, creating incentives for each branch of government to jealously guard its constitutional prerogatives from attack. That's why Madison explained in Federalist Number 51, quote, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Madison continued that countering counteracting institutions must be established because, quote, the great security against a gradual concentration of the several powers in the same department consists in giving those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motives to re resist encroachments of the others. So this system of reciprocal guarding is what we should expect, or what the framers expected, but this is what we've seen break down, in which we don't have the Congress guarding against the expansion of the administrative state, but in many ways, we also see Congress not just guarding, it, not guarding against it, but 
Congress actually facilitating the expansion uh, and passively allowing or even encouraging the expansion of this. So why were the framers wrong? So we see what the framers expected. We see what uh, at least I think we can uh, observe in the administrative state that it's grown to a point in which Congress is in fact delegating away power. They are in fact passing r relatively broad legislative commands and not very often intervening to either amend legislation, repeal legislation, or pass new legislation that, that is reactive to the administrative state's growth. The absence of that, why do we see the absence of that? Congress sometimes embraces this larger administrative role because it can gain from it. It can gain from passing broad legislation while avoiding internalizing the cost of the law's application. And agencies are more than willing to take what they're going to be given. More often than not, it is seen as the agency's fault or claim that the administration overseeing the agency is to blame for either regulation or for the absence of regulation or the existence of deregulation in an area. That is, when we have excessive regulation or claims of excessive regulation or we have claims of not enough regulation, we turn to the executive and say, why aren't you doing what you should be doing instead of asking what role is Congress playing in this process? Those who criticize this regulatory landscape point to the executive the narrative benefits Congress uh, in large part because Congress is not seen as the culprit. Assuming it's true that agencies get blamed for disliked regulatory decisions more than Congress, and placing the blame on Congress as the outlier, not the norm, this leaves Congress insulated from criticism and unmotivated to act in, as an effective check on agency action. Uh, part of this uh, then uh, causes us to ask, well, why isn't Congress intervening? In part, it's, they can cl simply claim it's not our fault, the agency did it. Individual members can rail against either agency action or inaction, explaining that Congress has done its job, what you're seeing on the ground, that's not our problem, we've done it already. Alternatively, they can explain that popular agency decisions, those things that the public likes, are actually the result of their wisdom and he their heroic efforts to pass legislation in the first place, that it, without them, the agencies couldn't do what, they, what they're doing. So it puts them in a perfect position for doing both of those things. And lastly, uh, when lawmaking without Congress becomes the norm, Congress is not forced to internalize the costs of gridlock. They're not forced to explain why they're not doing something to correct the administrative action uh, or, or inaction that is the result of some criticism. So let's imagine just for a moment if it were different. If the blame for bad regulations, whichever way you want to define bad, shifted its frame, the narrative could equally be, for example, that harsh environmental law or environmental law rollback, take your pick, are each Congress's fault because one, Congress created the executive discretion to do either category of thing, over or under regulation, and two, Congress has not taken new legislative action to force the executive to change position away from its preferred path. So for example, consider those who want a more aggressive regulatory approach, perhaps those who cast dispersions on the Trump administration for its mindset of regulatory restraint. Executive decisions to exercise discretion not to act get blamed on the executive, when a different framing of the same phenomenon could be, one, Congress deserves blame for giving agencies enough discretion to choose not to act or to be empowered not to act. And two, Congress deserves the blame because it is not legislated to force the preferred administrative action even when it may be within their constitutional powers to do so. Now flip it around for a moment and consider those that prefer a restrained regulatory approach, perhaps those who uh, frowned upon President Clinton era or President Obama era regulation uh, efforts. An agency's choice to use discretion in, to interpret broad and often ambiguous statutory language to enlarge its mandate again gets blamed on the executive, when a different framing of the same phenomena could be different. One, Congress deserves blame for giving agencies enough discretion to choose to act. Or two, Congress deserves the blame because it is not legislated to clarify the agency does not have statutory authority to act and discipline the agency as acting beyond authority. But these alternative frames are not the norm. Instead, we see uh, places in which the, the the public uh, opinion battleground for things like waters of the United States, for things like national monuments, for other things is, it, it, you know, the Obama administration is going too far on the waters rule, or the Trump administration is cutting too far back on the waters rule. But it's not about, well, Congress has passed a really bad law that makes it difficult for us to understand what it is and to give both, uh, both uh, administrations the opportunity to manipulate it in the direction that they so wish. 
So what we see in environmental law and elsewhere is a distinct kind of congressional ambition, not for Congress to actually be, be jealously protecting its own prerogatives, but an ambition to in fact shield itself from accountability for its actions by going along with agency aggrandizement. The agencies are incentivized thereafter to, to in fact take what power is given to them. If, if Congress is willing to step back, the agencies are willing to step in. There's a strategic ex acceptance of the enhanced lawmaking authority on the part of ambitious administrative agencies that willingly take advantage of the opportunity to aggrandize their power. It's very easy for us to beat up on administrative agencies for being too big and assertive, but can you really blame them? Uh, if, should we not consider them to be human actors that are both wealth, uh, you know, uh, power maximizing, uh, rational power maximizing, influence maximizing actors? Uh, agency uh, officials who take advantage of the opportunities Congress gives them are doing what we would expect them to do as human, uh, as, as human beings. Agencies benefit from the constitutional distortion. They have a greater power and ability to implement their own pro policy preferences through discretionary authority to act, to refrain from acting, or to reverse course. The self-interested uh, uh, ways in which the agency is, is motivated to do so means that is in part that they get more work. It expands the need and justification for the agency. A variety of studies have done, been done in political science and elsewhere about agencies' tendencies to perpetuate themselves. Agencies, if, you are if they are given the power, they will use it. If agencies are given the opportunity, they will expand themselves. Bureaucrats want job security. They will work to justify their own existence, which if, you can't, if you're not doing the regulations, it's harder to justify that, that you have uh, a purpose. They wish to capitalize on their developed, sometimes monopolistic expertise. If you've developed an expertise in, in a particular administrative area, you want to use it. Uh, in, in addition, they want to expand their budgets, expand personnel, and thereby gain allies within their departments, uh, broaden the scope of their authority, and otherwise wish to entrench themselves in a way that would be, uh, that, that allows for them, and, and in fact encourages them to take the, the, the opportunities that Congress has given them. So Congress is self-interested as the framers expected. That's the, the thesis of the piece you all have in front of you and that I think will be the basis of our discussion today. But it turns out that self-interest or self-interest of its individual members is not what the framers expected. The self-interest is instead to preserve against attack and the best way to do that is to uh, use uh, the example, use, use the uh, power of legislation to reap the gains for broad legislation uh, to allow themselves to uh, take credit for good administrative acts, but at the same time blame the agencies for when the agencies are getting things wrong. I suspect the Q&A and the panel will provide ample opportunities for us to discuss a, a few particular examples, including some of those I've already mentioned. and. Um, and that we can talk about some of the consequences of this. So part of the consequences of this is that the, the delegation does allow for the growth of the administrate administrative state. It allows for the growth of the, of, of the administrative state in a way in which lawmaking authority is really being, uh, uh, is resting with unelected, non-democratically controlled actors. Uh, and so it is a perversion of the separation of powers in that sense. It also, I think, supports revisiting deference doctrines, uh, in part because the deference doctrines themselves also allow uh, 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 the legislature to uh, avoid liability for their actions. If we had a more direct, um, into more, more, more uh, exacting interpretations of statutes, then Congress would be the one to blame because we would be saying, well, Congress did that. Congress is, or Congress wrote the law in a way that didn't allow us to do that. So I think uh, both the delegation and the deference debate, I hope, will be part of our, our ongoing discussion. And I will turn it uh, over to Robert. To Thank you. When I uh, first read this paper, my reaction was, since it's talking about agencies trying to expand their powers and increase their regulations, this must have been written before the 2016 presidential election, because that hasn't been what EPA has been up to. They've been trying to systematically reverse a lot of things that EPA did during the Obama administration. Uh, the article starts out very well by focusing on the two elements of our constitutional design that really reflect the genius of the founders. They were in a situation where they wanted a government, a federal government that would be effective and yet not power mad, so their solution was federalism and separation of powers, and those are very important. Uh, the word environment's not mentioned in the Constitution, but one of the reasons why our Constitution has been so enduring is because it's been able to adapt to changes 
in society and the kind of economy that we have today. Uh, EPA does have broad authority under the environmental laws, most of which were enacted in the 1970s, revised during the 1980s, and then further refined uh, in years after that. There is no constitutional problem with delegation of authority to issue regulations to EPA. That was settled by the Supreme Court unanimously in an opinion written by Justice Scalia in the Whitman versus American Trucking case in 2001, where he said that as long as you have an intelligible principle, the principle at issue in that case involving national ambient air quality standards was that EPA was instructed to regulate air quality so that it would be requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. And the court made it clear that they have never required any particular determinate formula for deciding how to make those difficult judgments about how safe is safe. Um, it is also the case that EPA has been shrinking. Uh, it has 14,172 employees now, the lowest level in 33 years. Its level of employment, employment peaked in 1999, 20 years ago, and at times the Department of Defense has spent more money cleaning up contamination at military sites than the entire EPA budget. So I don't think it's fair to say the agency's out of control. Now, as far as the blame game is considered, that's always going to be a phenomenon of Washington and politics and the like. It's often been said that you could actually get anything done in Washington if you don't care who gets the credit for it, but because everyone does care about getting the credit and blaming their political opponents, uh, it's often very difficult to get uh, things done in Washington. I didn't see anything really fundamentally new in this paper with respect to the phenomenon of agencies getting blamed by Congress and vice versa. In fact, I'd like to recommend there's an article, it's 30 years old, by Bill Rogers, The Lesson of the Owl and the Crows, The Role of Deception in the Evolution of Environmental Statutes. He looks at animal evolutionary biology and how some animals as a defensive strategy will try to pretend they're a different type of bird or something so that their predators can't attack them. And he says that often happens with environmental law. Congress will pass a really broad sounding instruction to EPA, make sure we're all safe. And then the very people that voted for it, if their constituents complain about being regulated, will rail against the agency in particular in instances when it comes to how you're going to uh, implement that. Um, I think some of the claims in the paper are overstated when uh, the paper says Congress has hardly passed any serious environmental legislation since the 1970s. The 1990 Clean Air Act amendments were really a fundamental updating of the act. And often what Congress did when it amended the Clean Air Act in 1977 and again in 1990 was to embrace specifically regulatory initiatives that the agency had started in order to solve problems and gaps uh, in the statute. In 1996, even though we had divided government, Congress comprehensively updated the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. In both those cases, what brought Congress together was that both the environmental community and the business community were fearful of something horrible that was going to have, and have to happen if the statute wasn't updated. And the really remarkable updating of our Toxic Substances Control Act in 2016 during the Obama administration with hardly a dissenting vote in either the House or the Senate, the environmental community got together with the chemical industry who was embarrassed that our chemical control laws were so outdated that the Chinese even had a better system of chemical regulation. Uh, I actually made that point in speaking to a group of chemical executives in China, and the next day there was this huge explosion uh, because of illegally stored chemicals, and one of them had pulled me aside and said, yeah, the Chinese laws sound better than the U.S., but they're never enforced. Uh, so. It's true there has been, because of divided government, a lot of legislative gridlock. 
But I don't think it's the case that Congress does not have a vehicle for supervising the agencies. When President Reagan took office in 1981, he wanted to relax the environmental statutes. He got nowhere with Congress, so he tried to block regulations by setting up this system of OMB review of all regulatory proposals and final rules by agencies, Executive Order 12291. That became institutionalized when President Clinton issued his own executive order updating that system. System. So before an agency can do anything and issue a regulation, there has to be buy-in from OMB and presumably the president during the Obama administration, President Obama, ordered EPA not to update the national ambient air quality standards for ozone. So there's a fair amount of control there. When the Congressional Review Act was enacted by Congress in 1996, it allows Congress to veto any regulations that they don't like, and it's only been used twice. Once at the beginning of the Bush administration to veto OSHA's ergonomics regulation, and 14 times at the beginning of the Trump administration. Why is it only used when there's a change of administration? Because the president has to sign these joint resolutions of disapproval or have them enacted over his veto, and the president has enough control over the agencies that it's rare they're going to do something that he is opposed to. Uh, I don't think it's fair to say, there, therefore, that EPA is out of control with rulemaking, even though the Administrative Procedure Act has fairly simple requirements for informal rulemaking, layer and layer of additional requirements have been imposed by executive orders such as President Trump's Executive Order 13771 that establishes a regulatory budget of zero net cost to industry and says you have to repeal two regulations for each new one. Now I think the two examples in this paper um, really are not the best examples to make the point uh, that Donald wants to make. A uh, much better one would have been the Clean Power Plan, where President Obama expressly went to Congress and said, I want legislation to control greenhouse gas emissions, and if I don't, then I'll use my existing authority under the Clean Air Act, and EPA did really push the envelope on that one. With respect to the waters of the U.S., it's not the case, as the paper claims, that this was some power grab by EPA. In fact, the EPA was responding to a court decision, the Rapanos decision, where the court split 414, and even though eight justices rejected Justice Kennedy's significant nexus test, it became the touchstone of how you get the fifth vote in the Supreme Court. So Chief Justice Roberts, in his concurring opinion, invited EPA to clarify things, and that's what the agency tried to do by focusing on what waters have a significant nexus to navigable waters. So, and that was largely an attempt to clean up a mess that wasn't the result of some agency interpretation, but of the confusion that had been created uh, by the courts. Um, in conclusion, our environmental laws have worked incredibly well. We've had both a healthy economy, clean air, and clean water. Uh, they're the envy of the world. If you doubt that, go to China. Last month, I was in China at the invitation of the Supreme People's Court to lecture to their environmental judges. They now have specialized environmental courts because they're so desperate to find a way in which they can improve the effectiveness of their environmental laws. They wish they had the laws we have. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Federalist Society for hosting this panel uh, and for uh, inviting me to participate in it. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, Professor Cochin. Um, your article really had me at the very first three words, the administrative state. Uh, according to my sources at the Harvard Law Review, that locution, the administrative state, is a sort of password for entry into a shadowy cabal of anti-administrativists, which is apparently some kind of malign force dedicated to dismantling the machinery of our government. Um, now, even worse, or I suppose better depending on your point of view, this panel was organized by the Federalist Society, which of course is the center of the anti-administrativist conspiracy. And obviously, if there's anybody from the Trump administration in the audience here, then I guess that what we would be engaged in is collusion. Now, that little bit of humor aside, uh, 
there's a grain of truth to all of that in the way that we, in the way that the battle lines have been drawn in the discussion of the role of the administrative state. On the one side, you have what we'll call the anti-administrativists, and gosh, I mean, isn't that such a pointed name? And on the other side, you have, let's say, the environmental movements, the consumer advocates, the civil rights movement, the social justice people, basically everybody whose uh, heart is in the right place. Now, what I'd like to discuss today is why those battle lines may be shifting, and even more importantly, why they should. Professor Kachin's account is that Congress is engaged in unilateral disengagement. To avoid accountability for unpopular policies, it legislates broadly, vaguely, or in some cases not at all, and then it leaves all the details, often billion dollar details, to the agencies. And the agencies in turn are only too happy to seize that power for reasons of self-aggrandizement and lack of accountability. All of this is true, and it shouldn't be controversial. It's what the political scientists and public choice economists have been saying for decades, and I've never seen a persuasive rebuttal. The real debate is over whether this is a good or a bad thing. Maybe we need a vigorous regulatory state to confront the complexity of the modern world. Perhaps Congress could never, as an institutional matter, handle all the details, even the billion dollar ones. And perhaps attenuated judicial review of all the agency's actions is really all that's needed to keep everything on track. I mean, that is, as I understand it, the argument in favor of the status quo. But I think the people who tell that rather Panglossian story are increasingly dissatisfied because there is, or at least there was, something deeper going on in Congress than unilateral disengagement. And that deeper strategy, it isn't working anymore. Now, let me share an anecdote to illustrate the point. It was back in 2008, I was 28 years old, and I was a senior policy analyst, if you can believe that, uh, at the Heritage Foundation. Congress was working on amendments to the Americans with Disabilities Act, and everybody knew that the legislation was going to move. In June, the House had passed its version. As relevant here, the ADA has always defined the term disability to include, and I'll quote, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities of such individual. The House bill dramatically expanded the definition in a number of ways, and one of those ways was by adding a new definition for the term substantially limits, which it defined to mean materially restricts, you know, whatever that means. The idea that this would, the idea was that that redefinition would work with the other broad provisions of the bill and knock down a, a number of the limits on who could claim protections under the act. But the Senate was facing pressure from the business community, which feared that the act's new definitions would open the floodgates to litigation. So several members of the relevant Senate committee asked me for help in redrafting the House's language. I gave them a laundry list of options to clarify the text and help ease the burden on employers trying to figure out their legal obligations. Ultimately, the Senate made a single change to the House's definition. It struck out only the definition of substantially limits as meaning materially restricts. And then everyone on both sides of the aisle declared this stunning compromise to be a victory both for the business community as well as for the disabled, win-win and a legislative achievement. Of course, here on planet Earth, there was no compromise. Congress ducked the issue entirely. I mean, it literally deleted the definition and replaced it with nothing. Uh, the reason that it did that was not unilateral disengagement. The Republicans had very little power in the 110th Congress, and they would take whatever they could get and claim a win. Um, meanwhile, Ted Kennedy, the Senate committee chairman, could be confident that the advocacy groups, the agencies, and the courts would take this new text, or really the lack of any new text, and run with it, um, and basically would wind up achieving the same result, whether or not Congress bothered to give the definition, uh, whether or not Congress bothered to define the term substantially limits. In other words, who cares? Now, this is, or at least it was, the deeper game that was going on in Congress. Congress could punt on making fundamental decisions in legislation, and those favoring stricter regulation could generally rest secure that the administrative agencies and the courts would get the right idea going forward. So why fight the tough fights in Congress when you can win a year or two later through regulations or maybe in litigation? And then once a given issue was decided, whether in a regulation or in a court case, that was it basically forever. It was a one-way ratchet, just as good as putting the actual words themselves in the US code. Now, undergirding this deep strategy were two separate assumptions. The first was that the courts would grease the skids to advance a pro-regulatory view of legislative purpose without really concerning themselves with over, you know, complicated details like, you know, the statutory text, for example. 
And that was a really good assumption for a long while. Back in, the late back in the 1970s, the DC District Court and DC Circuit ordered EPA to create a whole new billion dollar Clean Air Act program out of whole cloth. It's now known as the Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program. The relevant court decision relies entirely on a single, single statutory provision, which is the non-operative statutory purpose provision. In other words, Congress was just saying, here in general is the purpose of the act. And then it proceeds to quote a couple paragraphs of the legislative history to the effect that Congress's purpose was, and I quote, to protect and enhance the quality of the nation's air resources, end quote. And that was enough to force the EPA to impose federal pre-construction permitting for the entire country. And of course, the EPA was only too happy to comply. Um, but leisure suits and platform shoes are no longer in fashion, and neither is the freewheeling approach to statutory interpretation of the 1970s. As Justice Kagan famously observed, we are all textualists now. Um, even the reliably corrupt canon of statutory interpretation that remedial statutes must be liberally, liberally construed to affect their ends, I mean, effectively, it's a brick on the scale in favor of administrative power, even that canon has basically gone extinct in recent years. And it's fair to say that the courts have become increasingly skeptical of reading into statutes broad grants of administrative authority over important matters of economic and social, uh, social issues. In fact, that Harvard Law Review article that I mentioned at the outset accuses the current Supreme Court of mounting what it calls an attack on the administrative state because it sometimes refuses to conjure major agency powers out of statutes that don't quite appear on their face to convey them. The bottom line is that today's Ted Kennedys can't count on the courts to reliably carry out their regulatory agenda. The second assumption was that there would rarely, if ever, be regulatory reversals. Once a major policy was enshrined in regulation, that would be the end of it. And in practice, deregulation over the years has largely meant, in practice, slowing the growth of new regulation, not getting rid of the old regulatory dark matter. But that assumption also appears to have broken down. For every single major policy willed into being by the Obama administration, there is an equal and opposite Trump administration policy. Just in the environmental field, you have the Clean Power Plan, the Waters of the United States rule, and automobile admission standards, all of which are now undergoing what is politely called reconsideration. Again, if you're a modern day Ted Kennedy, you can't count anymore on making durable gains during democratic administrations. What you can count on is major policy losses during Republican administrations. Now, for people who feel this way, this new state of affairs must be awfully frustrating. The deep strategy that worked for decades has run out of steam. Seriously reversal, serious reversals are now coming regularly from the courts and from the administration. Whatever is to be done. The obvious answer, of course, is a return to legislating. There's a persuasive alternative history that if the Obama administration hadn't pivoted quite so quickly to regulation, we might well have a law that is an actual statute right there in the US code. You could look it up in everything. We might now have a law addressing greenhouse gas emissions. And the Trump administration wouldn't be able to do much about it except around the margins. Now, the same can be said of any number of progressive regulatory initiatives that have floundered in one way or another over the past decade. But so far, the mindset hasn't changed and the battle lines over the administrative state haven't budged. There's still this idea that the old strategy can still work, even though it very clearly isn't working, at least as working is defined for a certain side of this debate. So why is that? Part of the answer, I think, is inertia. And of course, there is very much truth to Professor Cochin's point that Congress still faces very skewed incentives against actually legislating. But that could easily change. Imagine, if you would hazard the imagination, a second Trump administration, one with more effective agency leaders rather than the firebrands who were often there at the start, and with more waves of judicial nominees. Could that be enough for all the right-thinking people, the ones whose hearts are in the right place, to start demanding more of Congress, or at least that the agencies be reined in. I think that it might be, and we're already seeing some of that stirring, we've, and we're already seeing some stirrings in that direction in Congress, particularly in the House, as members think through what they can do to restrain the current administration. So the incentives may well already be changing, and so far the anti-administrativists have held firm to their views, despite having some allies in the administration. Also, so far, the Trump administration has held firm in its rhetoric, at least, against administrative overreach. 
So what we may see in the near future is less a realignment on these issues, so much as a strange bedfellows coalition that agrees that the status quo really isn't working for anyone. Give it another few years, and somebody like Justice Kagan could be proclaiming that we're all anti-administrativists now. In sum, I would say that I, I think that Professor Cochin's conclusions are correct and accurate, but they're not necessarily inevitable uh, or eternal. Thank you. So I want to start by thanking the Federalist Society Article One Initiative and the Regulatory Transparency Project for putting this afternoon's program together and for inviting me to participate. I'm really so glad to have had the opportunity to read this article and to hear the conversation that's happening this afternoon because even though there's a lot in the article that I disagree with and I'll obviously get to all of that, I do think it's incredibly important and really interesting in its examination of the strategic and institutional interactions between Congress and agencies and what that can teach us about whether those bodies are doing their jobs or not doing their jobs um, depending on your perspective. So there's obviously a lot in the article, there's a lot we've already talked about this afternoon, so I'm just going to focus on a few points um, where I disagree um, with the article. And the first has to do with the legitimacy of the modern administrative state. You know, the article seems to assume that there's something illegitimate about the role that federal agencies play in modern governance. It, um, you know, discusses both Congress and agencies being, and I think uh, the professor mentioned this line in his remarks, um, it discusses Congress and agencies being, quote, complicit complicit in expansion of the regulatory state and the collapse of the containment walls designed to keep lawmaking inside Congress. So there's this sense that there is something um, that is averse or at odds with the Constitution in the way that modern governance operates. It reminds me a bit of a line from a dissent that Chief Justice Don Roberts wrote a few years ago in a case called City of Arlington, in which he said the framers could hardly have envisioned today's vast and fe varied federal bureaucracy. The administrative state, with its reams of regulations, he wrote, would leave the framers rubbing their eyes. And so I want to push back on this a bit, because I, I think this idea that the modern administrative state would somehow be anathema to the Constitution's framers is at odds with constitutional text, constitutional history, and constitutional values. You know, if you look at that history, when the framers set up our structure of government, they were aware, well aware that the new president wouldn't be able to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. He wouldn't be able to fulfill his core Article II responsibilities um, without the assistance of subordinate executive branch officials, officers of the United States, and without departments to assist him in carrying out those responsibilities. But what's significant is the Constitution um, didn't detail um, what those departments would look like. It, it didn't describe who those officers would be. Instead, it left Congress with considerable discretion to determine how best to structure the federal government. And Congress has long recognized that administrative agencies should play a critical role in the implementation of federal law. Um, Professor Jerry Mashaw has written that from the earliest days of the Republic, uh, Congress delegated broad authority to administrators, armed them with extrajudicial coercive powers, created systems of administrative adjudication, and provided for judicial review of administrative action. So this history, I think, is at odds with contemporary notions that the administrative state should be viewed with skepticism and with hostility. And I think that history also helps underscore why federal agencies are so important. And I think this is a point that the article gives short shrift. The article takes, I think it's fair to say, a pretty cynical view of Congress and the reasons why it sometimes delegates authority to agencies. You know, it says, for example, that Congress sometimes embraces a larger administrative role because it can generate gains from passing broad legislation while avoiding internalizing the costs of the law's application. But this ignores another really important reason why Congress often delegates authority to agencies, and it's that agencies have expertise, and agencies can use that expertise to implement congressional directives in light of changes on the ground, um, in light of new scientific knowledge. I actually think Robert mentioned the Obama administration's Clean Power Plan as an example of agencies potentially pushing the envelope, but I actually think um, it's a really good example of why um, agency, why Congress often delegates authority to agencies. So if you take a look at the Clean Air Act, over 50 years ago Congress enacted it. Um, they wanted a law that was dedicated to protecting the nation's air resources so as to promote the public health and welfare and the productive capacity of its population. Um, about 20 years later, Congress amended the law to speed up, expand, and intensify the war against air pollution in the United States. And to do that, Congress sharply increased federal authority and responsibility in the continuing effort to combat air pollution. 
In doing all this, Congress wrote the Clean Air Act not just to address pollutants that were known at the time, but also to equip the Environmental Protection Agency with the tools that it would need to respond to new problems as scientific knowledge evolved and new dangers were identified. Um, to that end, it established a comprehensive program which gave um, EPA the authority it would need to address these new problems. In establishing this scheme, Congress specified meaningful criteria the, AP, the EPA would need to follow in developing and implementing emission standards for new pollutants, but it also gave the EPA discretion. It recognized that the EPA was an expert agency, and so it wanted it to be able to elaborate upon the criteria set out in the statute to resolve ambiguities in it, and to apply the, the statutory criteria to new problems as they arose. In fact, Congress intentionally drafted certain provisions with broad language precisely so the EPA could play a key role in shaping the approach to developing and setting standards for specific sources and pollutants. It, it wanted to ensure that the EPA wouldn't be hamstrung, that it would be able to deal with new problems as they arose. In other words, Congress didn't want the EPA to have to return to Congress whenever a new environmental challenge emerge, emerges. And I think that helps explain you know, why we may sometimes see these issues, particularly in the environmental context. The article says um, that the problems it identifies are particularly acute in the environmental realm because environmental policy involves highly transparent, hot button issues. That is certainly often the case, but it's also a context in which science really matters, expertise really matters, and in which there will often be new developments. And so there's a benefit to having some flexibility and having an expert agency that can help address new problems as they arise. I also want to just push back really briefly on the suggestion that agencies are unaccountable, and this is something that um, Robert obviously spoke about as well. Um, the article says that you know, agencies face much less political risk due to the insulation of their activities from direct electoral control. But of course, while the people who work in administrative agencies are unelected, that doesn't mean um, that agencies are unaccountable because the president is elected and the president has considerable ability to set the direction of the administrative state in the environmental context and in many contexts. Um, and that's why, as both Robert and Andrew mentioned, we've seen considerable shifts over the past two years from the positions that were taken by the Environmental Protection Agency um, under the Obama administration. And then finally, I want to talk about the scope of federal power. You know, the article um, suggests that Congress may be particularly willing to allow environmental agencies to aggrandize because growth in federal administrative authority um, tends to erode limits on federal authority more generally. And the article suggests this enlargement happens in the environmental context because environmental harms present powerful narratives for justifying federal reach. But I want to suggest that this isn't a case of simply DC politicians telling stories that provide a ground for expanding federal authority. This is actually something that's built into the Constitution itself. Uh, in the summer of 1787, when the framers set out to create a national government worthy of the revolution um, that they'd fought, um, they wanted a government vested with sufficient powers for all general and national purposes, as the Federalist Papers put it. And so when considering which legislative powers to grant the new Congress, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention adopted Resolution 6. Uh, this was a resolution that declared that Congress should have authority to legislate in all cases for the general interest of the Union, and also in those cases to which the states are separately incompetent, or in which the harmony of the United States may be interrupted by the exercise of individual legislation. The delegates then passed Resolution 6 onto the Committee of Detail, which was responsible for transforming this structural constitutional principle into a list of enumerated powers. And so when the convention letter settled upon Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, that's the provision that, of course, grants Congress a number of specified powers, what it was doing there was in part addressing remedies or, de or addressing um, deficiencies in the Articles of Confederation, making sure that Congress had specific powers that it needed um, and that it hadn't had under the Articles. But, but taken together, they also wanted to ensure and to capture the idea that whatever object of government extends in its operation or effects beyond the bounds of a particular state should be considered as belonging to the government of the United States. In other words, the Constitution's framers wanted to ensure that the National Congress, the Federal Congress, would have the power that was necessary to address truly national problems. Um, it was, in other words, an attempt not to limit the Federal Government for its own sake, but rather was adopted so that the new federal government could pass laws on subjects and concerning problems that are federal by nature, those that the individual states couldn't unilaterally solve and that might in turn harm the union in the long run. So I, I've talked a lot about where I disagree with the article. I'll, I'll end on one quick note, um, one place of agreement, which is to say that I definitely do agree um, 
that there are a lot of places where people think about an issue in terms of executive action, um, but it's also totally fair um, and appropriate to think about it also in terms of congressional action. Um, this is true in the environmental context, and I think in many contexts, Congress often empowers administrative agencies to act by passing broad legislation that gives the agencies lots of discretion, and Congress could, if it chooses, decide to tamp down or limit that discretion. Now, we may disagree about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I certainly think it's incredibly important um, as a descriptive reality and important to take into account when we're thinking about these environmental issues and lots of other issues in which um, presidents and administrative agencies are engaging in significant executive action. Uh, so that's, that's where I'll leave, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I, I have to say that I've enjoyed this tremendously, and uh, I will also note that as someone who participates in lots of these sorts of uh, uh, panel discussions, you all basically came in right at 10 minutes, so I congratulate you for that, too. That was, uh, that was excellent. So, you know, Andrew mentioned that, that there does seem to have been something of a shift in the courts. Um, whereas many years ago, uh, they, were, they were quick to say, well, the purpose of the Clean Air Act is to improve and enhance the quality of the air, so basically anything that does that has to be okay. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but we have, especially with the PhD or the PSD program. My question is this, as, as the courts have perhaps become more concerned about um, the role of Congress and of the agencies, is it possible that we could see a resurgence of the anti-delegation doctrine? So for example, if Congress said climate change is a huge problem, um, uh, EPA, you figure out what we need to do about it. Come up with the, the most cost-effective solution that you can to address the issue of climate change. I don't know how likely that is to happen, but I will say that in California, that's almost what they've done with AB 32. I mean, they did have specific targets in mind, but then they turned over to the California Air Resources Board the, the responsibility of figuring out, essentially, how to come up with all these regulatory programs to meet that goal. So the question is, I think, to, to all of you, um, and maybe Andrew, I'll let you f f start first. I is it likely that with that sort of broad delegation, we would see the court step in and say, no, Congress, you have to do your job? Well, uh, you know, I, I think uh, people's heads may spin uh, to hear it said, but in a certain sense, the non-delegation doctrine is alive and well. It's not a well, uh, alive and well as something that is enforced in and of itself but it's enforced on a regular basis as effectively a, a, a canon of statutory construction. And so you've seen the courts, particularly the Supreme Court in recent terms, interpreting statutes in ways that avoid broad delegations to agencies over matters of you know, major um, social and economic importance. In other words, in this way, the courts have been acting in a way where there is statutory ambiguity or the lack of a clear grant of authority to throw it back to Congress so that Congress is the one making these types of fundamental decisions. Um, to the extent that that trend carries out, I, I think it's almost inevitable that you'll see more um, policy type discussion and policy decision making uh, process in Congress, and I would submit that that's a good thing. Um, you know, if you look at what happened with the clean, the clean power plan, it was an absolute fiasco. Um, I mean, and, and I think that that's something that w whatever you think of the merits of that particular policy, the way it played out really I don't think fit anybody's uh, view of good policy development and good policy results, in other words, both things. So, you know, having Congress making these decisions is a good thing, and I think that that's where the, 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 the case law is going. Uh, Robert? Yeah, I, I sort of take issue with your hypothetical, because I think that's already the case. Clean Air Act, as interpreted in Massachusetts versus EPA, Greenhouse gases are a pollutant. If EPA finds, as it did, that they endanger public health and welfare, they have an obligation to come up with some regulatory program. And while it's true that Trump's, the Trump administration is trying to repeal the Clean Power Plan, they have to do that based on the law and the facts and justify that in court for their new regulation to be upheld. And the one thing they can't do is say, it's not a problem unless they really want to try to monkey with the science, and I don't think that would be upheld in court. With respect to the PSD program, one thing I should mention, <laughs> Uh, Andrew's right that it was based on that one phrase in the goal section of the Clean Air Act. It was a very close case. The Supreme Court, I've gone through their archives, they were going to reverse the D.C. Circuit 
but Justice Marshall switched his vote at the last minute. So it was affirmed by an equally divided court. That's all the guidance we got from the Supreme Court, that one sentence. And EPA had fought against the obligation to do that because it was already so busy with all its other responsibilities under the Clean Air Act. But the kicker was that Congress stepped in and then wrote into the act the very regulations that EPA had adopted to implement the PSD program. So there was agreement in this, this dialogue between Congress and the agency uh, with respect to what should be done there. Two things on this. I, I think Andrew is uh, correct about the trend issue, and I think so that we see um, courts in, in some cases not willing to give effect to ambiguity. I think the second way that you can see um, a shift that you may be imagining in a more um, invigorated delegate, non-delegation doctrine would be to give effect to language. So it's the not give effect to ambiguity, and then secondly, to give effect to language. That is, take on the judicial duty to interpret uh, the law according to a variety of ways of statutory interpretation rather than finding ambiguity. So if, you, if as we see a shift in the Gorsuch kind of line of thinking about a judicial duty to interpret the law, it's judge's duty to interpret the law, and this entire Chevron deference debate comes into play in, in connection with the delegation issue because if we move to a stronger step one in Chevron deference and or if we just kick Chevron deference out the door and, and we're going to see much more judicial interpretation of what the statute means, the judges will say, this is what it means. Congress, if you don't like what we just said it means, then you have to change it. Both of those things, the non-effect to ambiguity and the more effect to language, um, kick it back into Congress's court, and they can't avoid the blame in the same way that they can now. They can't shift the blame because there's been a pronouncement by the judiciary that this is, in fact, um, uh, uh, the, the problem. Um, this is, excuse me, this is in fact the law, and therefore, uh, and it's Congress who has created the law, and it, or Congress has failed to create the law, and it goes into there. The, 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 the other thing I, I think that becomes important about whether or not the, the, even in that realm, the non-delegation uh, has, doctrine has teeth, or non-delegation principle has teeth, it depends on your vision of the administrative state. Um, that is, if we, I, admittedly, we have an intelligible principle standard. Admittedly, we have the idea that, that uh, agencies are expert and able to make expert decisions. If you push both of those in a, in a certain direction, then you can say, well, an intelligible principle just need, needs to be something to guide these experts to apply their expertise. And so the vision of what you believe uh, the administrative state should be doing drives your definition of what is an intelligible principle and leads to a much broader definition of an intelligible principle than we have today. The last thing I'll say is, as most people in the audience probably know, the court will have an opportunity in Gundy to, to uh, make some pronouncements on the non-delegation doctrine. And I think it has three choices. Uh, one is that it can, it can tell us that um, uh, non-delegation is not de doctrine is not dead. In other words, just uh, uh, with a very um, limited ruling uh, based on the facts in that case. Uh, it can say it's alive and thriving by having a very, in, uh, very strong ruling about what dele work delegation should be doing. Or it can say that dele the non-delegation doctrine is dead. Right? Um, it could if 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 the um, uh, sex offender registry um, uh, provisions at, at play there are actually upheld, then I think the delegation doctrine is dead. Brian? Yeah, I think the only, I, I agree with a lot of what was just said. I mean, I think it's, it's always difficult, always dangerous to make predictions, of course. I suspect that we're not going to see a full a frontal assault on non-delegation doctrine. I mean, this is a topic that has been the subject of lots of academic debate and discussion for a long time, and I don't think that we have seen um, the appetite on the court to do that, but I think it's exactly right that some of the concerns that animate it, you do see manifesting through other administrative law doctrines that come before the court. Um, and I do think Gundy is certainly a case to watch because I think it may tell us something, although I think it's also entirely possible it will tell us quite little, in part because it is a very different context, the criminal context there and the amount of power that is given to the Attorney General I think makes that case um, very different than most of the contexts in which uh, the doctrines at play. So th there is, I, th I think, a, a general view that people who criticize delegation to the agencies are, are conservatives who believe that we have too much regulation. Um, 
But I can think of some cases where Congress has been very specific in a way that has forced agencies to do something they wouldn't have chosen to do anyway. And the two examples that immediately come to mind are the Delaney Clause, where um, essentially it was read and, and meant to be a zero risk standard, which was completely unworkable, and was ultimately fixed by Congress. But, but also in the Clean Air Act, we have this, this program dealing with, with hazardous air pollutants. And into the statute, Congress listed 179 chemicals by name and said to EPA, thou shalt regulate these as hazardous air pollutants. When you looked at how that list was developed, th there was no risk assessment, there was no, they basically cobbled together a list from a couple of state right to no programs. And there were many people at EPA who would say, this, this is a waste of our time. <laughs> These are not the issues that we should be dealing with. So in some cases, I think you have, um, y you have clear demonstrations that, that delegation to administrative expert agencies doesn't always lead to more regulation and somehow forcing Congress to, to be more specific um, it would, would, be, would be sort of contrary to the general view that conservatives have about the role of, the role of government. Another example I would give in sort of the opposite direction um, is lead and gasoline. Uh, EPA, during the Reagan and then Bush administrations, phased out most lead and gasoline, but not all of it. But then EP Congress, in the 1990 amendments, specifically banned lead and gasoline because the agency had spent years and years of doing all these studies and the like and trying to figure out what was the safe level of lead and gasoline. So sometimes Congress gets it right. That has probably been the most successful environmental regulation for the world in history. Economists estimate since now virtually every country in the world uh, has phased out lead and gasoline that it generates up to $2 trillion in net benefits every year because we have less of this toxin in our blood now. And it was ultimately Congress who had to just say, quit fooling around, let's just get rid of it all. So one, one more question and then we'll, we'll open it to the audience. Andrew, you sort of touched on this, but I'd like to get the reaction from, from others. And that is, one, one of the reactions I had to the paper was, um, I think it accurately describes es essentially the dynamic, whether, that whether that's intentional or not, whether Congress has really been strategic or it's simply been a fact that they haven't been able to agree on anything other than broad principles, and so because they can't come to agreement on the details, they, um, uh, they, they essentially do this delegation. But the question is, is that, a, is that a problem of the past? Now that members of Congress and now that various uh, interest groups have seen what agencies have, have done with these broad powers and the concern about Chevron deference and other things. Is this a problem of the past or is this likely to continue to play on into the future? Well, you know, as I touched on in my remarks, I think that what you're describing is very much a problem of the future for a particular point of view. And the point of view is that the agencies over the long run, as well as the courts over the long run, would effectively be tools of the pro-regulatory side of the debate. Um, the idea that all of these statutes should be construed liberally, that the court should attempt in every possible way to effectuate their, their very broadly and very generally stated purposes. And the problem is, is that that's no longer, that's no longer borne out. And you know that's got to have some type of dynamic effect on the system, and I think that's what we're that's that's the play in the joints that we're starting to see now. As I mean, if if you look at it from the point of view of people who might want more vigorous environmental uh, regulation, um, you know, notwithstanding the costs and the burdens and so on, this must be a very frustrating time to be participating in these in these kinds of debates for the reason that so much of what, in their view, the Obama administration accomplished is up for grabs. Um, and th that's why it's my thought that the dynamic going forward is that it's actually a much safer thing to address these problems in Congress because the change in the dynamics, you know, the, what, what prevailed in the, er, in the mid and the late 20th century, this dynamic that the law was always going to wind up being interpreted in one particular way in one direction, that doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't happen anymore. So either you legislate or, or you're going to lose. So, 
the one thing I, I would not want to be seen as doing is defending the Congress as, as capable of creating great laws, uh, right? <laughs> um, uh, so so uh, in a system of separation of powers, I think we, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to argue where, where most of that power should lie, not necessarily that it will be used effectively. So there is always going to be a risk, uh, especially of interest group politics as well. And, and you mentioned the idea that interest groups are starting to understand this. You have uh, all the problems, including of these lists, right, of where did some of these things come from? We have lists of th that get into legislation. The level of specificity is often sometimes driven by an interest group, not necessarily f in the public interest. Um, and it may be anti-expert. You know, an expert might not like an exception that gets into a particular bill, but that's because an interest group got it in there. So there's a lot of problems with legislation in and of itself. So w when, we, when we turn to the legislative fear to, to do this, then we have to remember that we have to be skeptical of the legislative fear, sphere as well. Nonetheless, um, I think Andrew's right that um, the durability of legislation should make legislation more attractive. And so if we start to see that, that agencies are less reliable uh, because changes in administration are, are likely to bring these kinds of changes, then, then perhaps people will begin to shift their focus into that direction. At the same time, however, the success rate, uh, um, despite what Bob talked about, about the, the, that there are some environmental laws that have come into play over time, uh, I think the success rate is still low. I mean, even, and we've not amended a lot of things that, that are outdated. Um, so the fact that we have some examples doesn't negate the general point that, that legislation is hard. Bicameralism and presentment is hard for a reason, uh, but it's even harder in a polarized world. And so I, when you ask about the future, um, can this actually be a place where we redirect our energy and uh, yes. Can it be a place where we re redirect our energy and get outcomes? That one I'm not so sure about because I think that our climate uh, for legislation is, is at least right now uh, too toxic to, to, to accomplish much. And I, I don't know how that changes. So you need some bigger changes uh, to come along in the, in the culture of Washington, I think. If I could add one thing, bicameralism and presentment are hard when you don't have to do it. And so I wonder that, you know, in the coming future, that may be the key shift. It, you know, to the extent that it's necessary, it will become easier. For the, uh, um, for, for the people who believe that uh, agencies have over-regulated, um, could Congress substitute for the expert judgment of, let's say, EPA? Do we want Congress defining what an ephemer ephemeral stream is, what a wetlands is? Uh, on the, this is a Congress that has not been able to pass a budget or an immigration statute. So even though this might be a desirable solution to move some of these issues, to Congress, I don't see that it's practical in this Congress or a foreseeable Congress that uh, they could that it could apply their expert judgment in a way that would be better than than what you would criticize about agencies. I I think part of what Andrew says right, and that is that if they're forced to, then maybe things would change. The 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 other thing is, um, and and so so perhaps they've not. Um, called on the experts that they should as often as they should because they don't need to. Um, there also is a difference between uh, legislating with greater clarity um, and completely giving up the expert model. I think that we can still legislate with greater clarity and with more direction to the agencies while still allowing some of the on-the-ground application to go through and take advantage of the expertise. Um, so I don't think it has to get to the point where every, you know, s every particular level of pollutant is defined in, in every statute but it does need to be a way in which there's, there's greater control. There's also a lot of um, uh, uh, ways in which we could be creative in thinking about this if we wanted to and if we had to. Uh, there's proposals out there for, instead of a Congressional Review Act in which you do a thumbs up or thumb, uh, or excuse me, a thumbs down on legislation, uh, require, you know, proposals to require that uh, regulations get um, uh, promulgated through the agencies but don't become final until Congress actually passes them into law. Uh, so that there could be ways in which you could still take advantage of the expertise of agencies or, or agency experts without um, giving up the legislative power. Let me just, so 
Brianne, Robert, are you guys optimistic that if things are turned back over to Congress that that might force Congress to, to, uh, to, to, to act? Uh, it's possible, but uh, in the very point you made about the hazardous air pollutants, that was a reaction to what Congress perceived as a long-time failure by EPA. For, you know, over, for 20 years, the agency had regulated only, you know, a tiny handful of hazardous air pollutants, so Congress then stepped in and was incredibly specific. In the 1980s, when Reagan was perceived as trying to block EPA from issuing regulations, Congress responded by writing specific statutory deadlines into a lot of the statutes when they were reauthorized, and even doing something like the RICRA land ban, where Congress said, you have so many days if you, to make a decision about how to safely land dispose of this waste, or it's going to automatically be banned from land disposal. So, Congress sometimes reacts to agency failures in ways that the agencies aren't going to like because they're so completely uh, specific. Yeah, I think it's, it's tough to say. I mean, obviously, if Congress were forced to, would Congress be able to get some things done? Probably. But I guess the question is what we would be losing in that shift. Because I think, you know, obviously there are ways in which Congress can take account and use expertise without simply um, delegating decision making to expert administrative agencies. But what expert administrative agencies can also do is take account of shifts on the ground and have greater flexibility than Congress does. And that's something that Congress has for decades and even longer than that sought to make use of. And so, you know, I think in thinking about these questions, you know, one thing that I think about is one, what are the constitutional limits or lack thereof? Because one thing that I think has been absent from the conversation is why, you know, I think, you know, as I talked about at the beginning of my remarks, there's a sense that somehow this is problematic from a constitutional perspective, um, but I haven't heard kind of a specific grounding in constitutional text or history that would explain why that's so. And if it's not, you know, what are the real advantages that we have from a system in which Congress can, you know, provide direction and clarity and guidance, um, but allow experts to then act upon that guidance in ways that, you know, for decades now has been ensuring that our air and water are cleaner than they would otherwise be, that our workers are protected, um, that consumers aren't taken advantage of, and things of that nature. I think that one of the things that we're ignoring in this entire question is the role of the states. And the WOTUS rule was, or not the WOTUS rule, but the Clean Water Act was actually written to acknowledge the fact that we have different hydrology and hydrologic situations throughout the entire United States. So the Clean Water Act granted to the federal agencies or the federal government to be able to address the navigable waters of the, of the United States, but then it was the states that were to address the very kinds of questions that you're talking about. So the question being whether Congress should be defining what is an ephemeral stream or what is a, uh, the, uh, the hydrologic connection between particular groundwater wells and, and, and a particular waterway, that's where the states need to come in. And so I think that's where that partnership is, whether it is with the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, or whatever it is. We have such a variety of things and, and, and throughout the United States that are impacted by these decisions. So I think part of the discussion has to be that the states are where a lot of that expertise is, and I think that that's the way that, the, that this legislation was written from the very beginning, was to acknowledge that. So I think it's very important that the states be a part of that discussion as well, and then I think you get better legislation both at the federal level as well as the state level. And one of the nice things about virtually all the federal environmental regulatory statutes is they specifically authorize states if they want to go beyond the federal minimum to do so. And you're seeing that become even more important now as the Trump administration rolls back some very popular regulations that the states are going to step in and say, no, we're going to keep the regulation at the state level the way it was, but the ultimate battle uh, going to be over California's standards for automobiles, which for decades were stronger than the federal standard. I think it's an excellent point. Um, I don't think that setting federal minimums necessarily solves the problem, right? There's, there's, a lot of there's a lot of diversity within the states, and it's bigger than just uh, particular instances in which, where, in which delegated programs make sense. Um, there's a lot of definitional issues that are meant to be left to the states, and that's part of the constitutional design as well. Um, the, the idea of, uh, Br Brian, your, your comment about you know, what's, what's the constitutional authority, I think we, have, we, we can have a 
a whole other panel on, <laughs> on, on, on just that. Uh, so there obviously is the vesting clause and things like that. But, but there, there's also the, and, and true that there existed administrative agencies on a much smaller scale with a much smaller understanding of the federal role. Um, at, at, the, at the founding. And, and that's part of the problem with the growth of the administrative state from a constitutional perspective is that the, this is not of the, of the more ministerial and, and truly federal natured programs that we saw in, in some administrative uh, law type uh, um, uh, institutions at the founding. This instead is a, is a government which has accepted a broad mandate of federal authority and a broad mandate of governmental authority uh, that, that gives a broad scope of possibilities for administrative um, intervention into uh, the, the, the lives of individuals, but also the, the power of states to actually act. So I think it's an excellent point that we need to remember. It looks like we have another question over. Um, there's been a lot of discussion today about um, Congress and administrative agencies sort of viewing them all as institutions, but they're all made up of people, and that can have an impact on how they act. On the administrative agency side, it seems to me in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a trend towards um, appointing people as commissioners or heads of agencies who stay for only a couple of years and don't have a lot of ex expertise when they come in. The impact of that is that they're trying to have a list of accomplishments for their political agenda, but their staffs who are there longer and are more expert do things that the commissioners don't understand and can't control. And that's where the agencies get out of control the most. There's an insulation between them and the presidential appointment in that the people who are presidentially appointed don't have a grip on what's going on. Do any of you think that that's important to the excessive uh, agency activities? Well, I agree with you with the idea that um, agency administrators often come in with a list of agenda items, or sometimes administrations come in with a list of particular agenda items for agencies. I think the toxic part of that, however, is how it interacts with the deference canons applied by the courts, where you might come into office with some broad view of some objective that you would like to achieve, and the first order of business then, it, it's not so, the problem is not the disconnect between the agency head and the staff. The problem is that the agency head can direct the staff, please search through the statute, find some kind of ambiguity or something of that sort that we can arguably you know, peg as a legal hook uh, for this objective that we would like to achieve, and then there's your program. And the problem is we've it, it, you know, increasingly seen is that you go from administration to administration, you get whipsawed on these regulatory programs, both from, the regula both from the regulators changing and having different policy priorities, as well as from the courts looking at some of these uh, regulations and saying, wow, like, that's really pretty aggressive. So I, I think the real problem is the combination of objectives, which there's nothing wrong with that, with this uh, sort of perverse view that, well, you can do whatever you want within a very broad sphere because there are always ambiguities somewhere and why not take advantage of that? I, I think you make a good point. Um, I'll just add one thing. That is, if, if we believe in a democratic accountability model, and, and, and Brianne made a good point, uh, that, that is that um, the executive is democratically accountable. Um, uh, and, so, and so the political appointees are feeling some of that democratic accountability as well. Uh, the farther you get down and the farther you get away from the appointment process, uh, the less democratically accountable those individuals probably feel themselves. Their security of their position is, is not uh, dependent on democratically elected individuals um, unless they're going to be disciplined for their actions, um, disciplined for moving beyond a point at which they would be tolerated by the democratic electorate. Um, and if we have, as if it is true what the questioner's saying, that um, uh, some political appointees are so focused on a particular agenda items that they're losing sight of disciplining or overseeing or supervising the agency more generally, then I think the, the, our, our, our trust in democratic accountability as a check on what the agencies are doing um, should, should uh, be lessened. Um, that is, we can't trust it nearly as much if those, if those individuals are insulated from supervisory authority because there's a few sort of marquee items that the, that the, true polit that the political appointees want to focus on. Um, I don't know that that's actually how it operates, um, 
uh, but um, uh, it's, uh, it could be a risk. I'll flag actually a different accountability issue that we're confronting now, which I think is an abuse of acting officials. You know, so the heads of federal agencies and high-level officials, you know, many of them across agencies are supposed to be appointed by the president, of course, but also confirmed by the Senate so that the Senate can act as a check on presidential appointees, can have input into what their objectives, et cetera, are as they go into office. And what we've seen in this administration across agencies is, um, I think, a really unprecedented use of acting officials in an attempt to evade the Senate's advice and consent role. You know, Interior Department, for example, has a number of positions now where the head of various agencies that are supposed to be Senate confirmed are vacant, and so you have um, political appointees who are exercising all of the duties and authorities of those officials, even though they never went through the Senate confirmation process. So I think there are, you know, accountability issues that affect how federal agencies do their job and democratic accountability that um, are worth paying attention to. And that's one of those areas where if we, if we stop paying attention, then we start to ingrain certain practices um, that perhaps will repeat themselves, uh, not only in this administration, but across administrations. Yeah. And so, um, it, it, you know, even if you can't always be sued for something uh, if, or effectively sued for something doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to adhere to the original constitutional design. Um, and uh, that, that is something which is, which is a definite risk um, that we start to, as we evade, if we are evading the constitutional design that it becomes, in, that evasion becomes entrenched and repeated across administrations. I actually think that it's, it's possible that that's actually an interesting sort of case of this, you know, uh, splitting responsibility uh, with the Congress because Congress did in fact pass the Federal Vacancies Reform Act in which one might argue the Senate, perhaps illegally under the Constitution, ceded the ability to place acting officials into roles for certain time periods. You can make the argument that that act is being violated, perhaps, uh, or you could say that that act violates the Constitution, but that would be its own panel. There may be um, multiple problems. <laughs> um, I, I actually wanted to go back to uh, something that was said earlier and, and, and ask, perhaps, um, if the reason why Congress can get away with sort of switching back and forth between saying, oh, oh I get credit for this versus, oh, I had nothing to do with it, is because it's sort of a multi-member entity, or, I mean, so many members in the entity that it, that it, that it makes that kind of thing possible um, I mean, there are, of course, very many people in the administration as well, but where you have nice, clean lines of authority, it makes it harder to disclaim responsibility. Whereas in Congress, I imagine as an individual member, I can attach myself to a successful bill right before it goes through, whereas failure to act is never my fault, at least with my constituents, I would imagine. Is that, is that kind of what's going on, do you think? I think it is. I think constituent-friendly and constituent-specific uh, 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 behavior is, is seen all the time, and and so it is a way in which you, they can say, look, oh, it, it also allows you to say, and if there was anything I can do about it, it's all the it's the other uh, folks' fault that won't join me in, in trying to do anything about it, right? Um, so I think that that's absolutely right. I think that's the vehicle by which it becomes effectuated. Any other questions? Well, let me just uh, say I, I thoroughly have enjoyed the conversation. It's given, I think, all of us a lot to think about. Um, and I, I won't ask you to join in thanking me because I'm going to turn the, the podium back over to Nate. Okay, very good. Well, yes, uh, on behalf of the Article One Initiative and RTP, we want to thank Professor Koshin for uh, his paper and uh, this uh, excellent uh, panel for the discussion today. So thank you very much.